So welcome everybody to the first Language Teachers Forum for 2023. It's a joint initiative between Griffith University, where I'm a lecturer in Japanese, and the Modern Language Teachers Association of, um, of Queensland. Um, it's great that we've got um, the, the title Chat GPT for Language Teachers. So it's, it's um, a generative AI and Chat GPT, and I'm sure everyone's been talking about it. Um, recently, everywhere I go at the university, people are talking about it every every meeting. Um, <clears throat> I left the Gold Coast early this morning to teach in, in Brisbane, reading the Gold Coast Bulletin on the train. What do I see um, a few pages in? When AI takes control of our films, and it's an article by James, Dr. James Burt, Associate Professor of Film Screen and Creative Media at Bond University. And he said, everyone is talking about chat GPT. Even chat GPT is talking about chat GPT. It helped me to edit this article. <laughs> so I thought, how timely. Um, it, it's suddenly taking over the world. Um, so it's wonderful to have Dr. Simone Smiler here for the University of Queensland. And she's taken this on as one of her special areas at the moment. Simone's the Director of High Degree Research at the School of Education at UQ and a senior lecturer in the um, education. So we're really excited to hear what this might mean for, for us as language language teachers, Simone. So thank you very much. And Kate is here as well, um, who helps me run um, the Language Teachers Forum. Right. We have on. about 14 people in the room here at South Bank in Brisbane and um, about another 20 online. So oh, it's, um, it's one of our biggest numbers for a while. So it's <laughs> obviously a, a great topic and we'll be filming it and I'll put out an email when it's all ready. It's going to be edited by Griffith University uh, because there's a lot of other people been emailing me saying, oh, Dan, I've got such and such on Thursday afternoon, but I'd really love to see it if there's a um, if there's a recording. So yeah, it's going to go out fairly widely. So thank you very much, Simone. Thank you, um, Lee. And first of all, I would like to thank you for running the Language Forum for years and years. And uh, and yes, uh, and it, it keeping on coming. And it's such a strong uh, forum for all the language teachers in Queensland. It's something people look forward to. So it's uh, thank you very much. It's really fantastic. Um, so I would like to start today by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land we um, meet today. Um, we are going to talk about many, many languages, uh, as you will soon see. Um, unfortunately, none of the indigenous languages are yet included. In Inshallah. Chat. Oops. Yeah. That's not, sorry. If everyone yeah. online could mute for us, please. Thank okay. you. Um, chat GPT is the title is in the title and I used it in the title because everybody talks about it now and it's kind of it's a bit of a catch you know a catchphrase but because but actually and you're probably all aware of this this is this is only one of hundreds and hundreds of generative AI tools that are available and will become more and more available in our world um ChatGPT has particular properties, I suppose, that are useful for us as language teachers. And so we'll focus on that today, but you will see in the presentation um, that I'm reaching out to other tools as well. And um, I'm doing this from a, um, a very positive position. I'm not starting kind of, I'm not starting with, well, I'm not involving um, my talk today about valid areas of concern around assessment and um, cheating and plagiarism and so on, but I'm actually starting from a different perspective and a different um, position, and that's looking at generative AI, um, Chat GPT, other, other um, generative AI tools as a collaborator for us. So it's like a human to human and human 
to machine collaboration that I'm personally interested in. This is not to say that I'm not engaging in um, the discussions around the concerns, etc. It's actually part of it to see where the strengths and the lim limitations are. But for me, it's a tool that we can use for our work, for example, as language teachers in um, a really cool way, I have to say, and in a time saving way. And that's what, what I'm particularly interested in today. So I'm just going to start with the next first slide. So welcome to the workshop. We'll explore today how ChatGPT, a generative AI large language model, can be used to support primary and secondary language teachers, how ChatGPT is capable of generating human-like text and can assist in a variety of language learning activities, and how to work with strengths and limitations of this new tool. So I thought I'll just start with the term AI or artificial intelligence, because that's one of those terms that is always thrown around, but we, we might not be completely um, aware of what, what's actually behind this term. So artificial intelligence refers to human produced technology that systematically uses large sets of data. This allows to predict results, generating, for example, written outputs. It finds patterns in a massive set of data, referred to as training data, to predict text. Natural language processing is at the core of most AI applications. Users of AI want to use natural language instead of some artificial uh, language or graphic interaction. So everything you can do with ChatGPT, you could also do in a software language, but most people just don't want to use that kind of language. They want to use natural language is what we are using now. The ability of natural language processing provides the possibility of natural language interfaces and natural language creations. So that's the kind of amazing thing that's actually behind it. All right, so a new breakthrough, Chat GPT is based on GPT-3. There was a GPT-2, there was also a GPT, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera, but the world didn't really take note of that. If you look at the research that's, that's happening, there's, there has been research in this field, like real research for about 30 years. AI and those possibilities have been around for 70 years. So this is not new. This stuff is actually, has been around, but it's basically last November, I think it was the 30th November that OpenAI released this GPT-3 and then shortly afterwards, chat GPT that made it available to huge numbers of people to pretty much to the whole world and it just went like a bomb everyone immediately went onto it millions of people went onto it and started to use it so the interesting thing for me there is that it was only when chat gpt was released that everyone got onto it when really discussions and research about how to use it have been researched for about 30 years so the large language model, because that's what GPT-3 is, is a, um, is a deep learning model that has been trained on large on a large corpus of text, so in, in trillions of words. Many current AI applications use GPT-3 as the back end of their text generation capability. So not just chat GPT. GPT-3 is used for lots of other applications as well. It's underlying other applications. For example, Jasper is a tool that's used in marketing that's completely based on, on GPT-3. An open playground is now available for teachers and researchers to query uh, GPT-3 directly. For example, chat GPT, that's now available for all of us to um, play with. I'm just going to stop for a moment and allow everyone maybe to ask any questions that might might be relevant or might occur. Also on the um, use the chat on 
on your um, Zoom link as well, please. Is there, are there, yeah? Is it being used in other countries and other languages as well, or is it only in English? No, um, it's one of my slides coming, coming up, but it's used, yeah, no, that good, very good question. Um, it's used in lots of countries in a number of languages, I have to say. It is not as if it's used in every available language. So, for example, um, not a lot of small, like more minor minority languages are not involved yet. But it's probably just a matter of time. Um, just sorry, a couple of mm. online questions. Yeah. So um, one I is, read them, yeah, no, I'll, I'll read it. It's fine. <laughs> um, so how do we access it? Yeah. Um, what and I think that might be coming up shortly. But what does GPT mean, and who owns the company, and how different is GPT three from one or two, or in the future four? Mm. So, yeah. So there's, there are lots of questions. I'm trying to. Yeah. Get, so what, what was does the GPT one? stand for? Yeah. So GPT. And who Lots owns the company? Oh, okay. Generative coming, hold on. Free trained transformer. Mm -hmm. What was the next question? Um, who owns the company? Well, sort of open AI is the company open AI. That's the company that trained it, that trained GPT-3, but it's it's in the name. It's open. Mm -hmm. It's actually used, it can be used by anyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, what was the next and question? And how is GPT three different from one or two? or different from future iteration. Yeah. So how it is different from one or two, I would probably not be the best person to discuss because that's a software question. I just know that it is now huge. Like the, the number of data that has been used is massive. And that's probably the difference to jet uh, to GPT two, where which was also big, but it's just become absolutely massive. Now G GPT-4 is being used at the moment by Microsoft in their Bing search engine. And this means it has now kind of cut through the fourth wall of using the internet. GPT-3 does not use the internet. It is a closed system that has been trained on a... Um, on a closed number of website books, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. but uh, but GPT four, which is at the moment being trialed as part of Bing, of the Microsoft search engine, can cross into the internet, can do everything that GPT three can do, but can also access the internet. Um, at the moment, Bing and, and Microsoft search engine Bing is not yet with the chat GP, with the GPT-4 included, it's not yet available for everyone, but you can put in a request to use it. Um, and um, usually after a few days, you get access to it. Um, so what, what's happening, of course, in that field is Microsoft is very keen for people to use it because every time you use it, it gets more data and it gets more information and so on. But pretty much this gives you a bit of an idea if you're not not yet. If it has, if it hasn't sunken down yet, this is going to change our world. Yeah, of that's right. Yeah, somebody's somebody's agreeing with me. <laughs> yes, mm -hmm. so, and it's like it's there is no return now. There is no going back. <laughs> there is no going back. Actually, um, I'm asked for a long time already by, yeah. the, by the Siri. Yeah. So, um, exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. So we need to face this yeah. and see what we can do with it and how we get along with it and help our students. And yeah. I think it's something that we, we really need to think about. Yeah. But it's good that you mentioned Siri because Siri is, an, Siri is a generative artificial intelligence. But it's really good that you mentioned that because there's a fundamental difference. Because I think somebody asked that before. There's a fundamental difference between Siri yeah. And chat GTP, GPT, sorry. Siri, you could ask a question and it kind of comes back at you with an answer. If you then say, well, given your answer, 
uh, blah, 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 blah. It will not understand what you're saying. Where chat GPT does, it can refer back to the, the first question and to its own answer. And it can then engage with you truly in, with a, in a dialogue. Interactive. It's interactive and dialogic. Yeah. Which Siri isn't. Yeah. yeah. So that is one of the fundamental differences might somebody ask uh, beforehand. So if we look at a couple of ideas of what chat GPT is, it stands for, as I said, generative pre-trained transformer. It is a type of AI that can understand and generate human-like text based on nat natural language processing. The training data for chat GPT includes a diverse range of sources, such as websites, news articles, books, and more until 2021. Okay, so this is important to know if you ask it a question that is about something that's later than that, it cannot actually answer it. It hasn't got the data. However, Bing and the search that the GPT-4 will be able to do that up to date, like any time because it is, will have access to the internet. The model has been trained to predict the next word in the sentence. So it's pretty much like predictive text. So like your, you know, like your text in a, in a, on a phone, et cetera, et cetera. But it's a lot, lot more complicated and it does it a lot more fine-tuned. Based on the context of the preceding words, it allows it to generate human-like text that is grammatically correct and contextually relevant. ChatGPT has been trained, and here's the, here's the question to the answer about the languages, has been trained in English, Spanish, French, German, Italian, Dutch, Portuguese, Chinese, simplified and traditional, Japanese, Korean, Arabic, Russian, Finnish, Swedish, Turkish, Polish, and Hebrew at the time of me searching this. So this is also a, an evolving dynamic area, which means that it can now, it might now be available in other languages as well, yeah? yeah. Simon, I'm just interested in this because the language that we, well, you know, there's language and language and culture. And I believe there's a bit of this discussion happening at the moment about how the fact that this supposedly is multilingual is still essentially based on the Anglo-Saxon model of knowledge input. Is, does this mean that we're actually seeing uh, some of these cultures being anglicized when we start using that particular uh, could be, software? Could be a worry. Um, this could be definitely a worry. This is very much based on Anglo-Saxon type of thinking and American development and so on. So as with everything, it will be tinted through that particular perspective. Now, as you know, probably AI learns all the time. Um, so every time you correct it, like every time you put something in and and write, um, you know, write me write me a fairy tale set in in Germany <laughs> or something like this, and it uses maybe tropes that are not typical German or, or kind of just Anglo-Saxon types. And you can get back to it and say, look, this is actually not, not what I would have expected you to do. It learns from that. And then the next person who will ask something like that um, might get a more fine-tuned answer. So there is actually a possibility that for you as a user to manipulate it, which is also its danger. Yes. Yes, yeah. I've just got another online question. Yeah. Just another online question here. How often will the data that chat GPT has be renewed? So the question is asking, will there be a day when it can um, answer our questions with up-to-date data? Yes, the answer is basically when Microsoft releases Bing, the search engine Bing with GPT-4, then you will have the same um properties that ChatGPT now has. Um, you can create the same types of text, et cetera, engage in the dialogic conversation with the search engine. Um, plus it has up-to-date at any one time, up-to-date information because it can access the internet. Yep. Good. Yep. So another yep. question? Oh, or? no, that's okay. okay. Just a comment. That's good. Uh, yep. Yeah, but this is, I think this is a very important and very interesting question. 
uh, what is our role as users? What are the dangers in um, manipulating the AI? Because the AI is actually not thinking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just a machine. <laughs> so we can we can manipulate it. So one of the things that the organ uh, the um, um, creators of this have put in are so-called guardrails. And guardrails try to pick up things like um, conspiracy theory, racism, um, you know, incitement to hatred and things like this, stereotyping. Um, it's trying to put those guardrails in, but it's not working very well at the moment. So yesterday I asked ask it to write something for me about a professor and it immediately gave it back to me as a male person. Oh, yeah. on International Women's Day, no less. Yeah. <laughs> I called oh, it the day. I called it a donkey then. <laughs> <laughs> Professor so and so is a woman, you donkey. <laughs> It then it apologizes. Yes, yes. So yeah. Oh, yeah. So mm -hmm. yeah. So it will it will pick up on um, so, so societal biases, I suppose, and stereotypes, but not because it's thinking. It's simply because it has looked at all of its data and it's figured out that eighty percent of all professors are male. So the chance that this professor discussion about professors is I, I, male. <laughs> I think it's about eighty percent. I might be wrong. I think worldwide eighty percent. So it it kind of made the assumption. Okay, it's probably going to be a man. Mm -hmm. So we definitely have to be very careful about those biases, those things that it will just do because it's a statistical machine. That's all it does. It's stati it's statistics. It works on statistics. So with those um, um, pre-trained languages, what, what I thought was it's a little bit sad to see that it's such a small number and such a kind of, you know, like typically big, big majority kind of number um, languages. But it's a good thing if you look at it, it's probably all the languages that we teach. So, <laughs> so we can at least... Most of us, I think, there might be other people who teach other languages as well, but most of us can probably make use of it because those languages that we teach here in Queensland are included at the moment. Okay, so why we're meeting today is to kind of have a look at what, how this can actually support education. What role can it play in the typical things that are happening in education? So one of the things that it can do, it can personalize learning experiences. Uh, and this is because you can just, you can run a particular text through J G uh, GPT uh, to chat GPT a hundred times and give it specific information about how this text should be changed. So if you've got 30 different levels of um, proficiency in your class, you could potentially run the same text through it 30 times and have it simplified or have it uh, supported with, with you know, explanations or definitions for the, for the weaker students or have some extension questions for the stronger students, et cetera. So there's this huge uh, possibility about personalized learning experiences through this and it takes seconds i don't know how much you have played with it already but it literally takes it takes seconds to do this chat gpt can be used to create engaging and interactive learning experiences focused on learning objectives for specific lessons just to kind of quickly explain chat gpt will not do the thinking for you as i said beforehand you come to it with your expertise and the more expertise you bring to it, the better the outcome will be. In computer science, there's this kind of term, rubbish in, rubbish out. You might have heard this. This very much applies to, to chat GPT. If you give it prompts, and that's what the tasks are called that you, you give them. If you give it prompts, which are too generic, then it will just come out with very generic stuff. But if you come in with very specific knowledge about the Australian curriculum, your lesson objectives, your focus on a particular language um, 
you know, item or grammar item, then it will very much look at that expertise. And that's why ChatGPT only works so well because it's used by people who are already in the know. Mm -hmm. They are knowledgeable people to put in their knowledge and ChatGPT does the grunt work for them. If you were just, if you had no idea about language teaching, you would put in a prompt that would be very, you know, very general or where you wouldn't have the language, you wouldn't have the ideas, you wouldn't know what to put in. You would notice the errors. You would notice the errors. You would not them. exactly. Mm -hmm. So it's very much something that is based on working on a collaboration between machine and human knowledge. Just a question here. And I oh, just thought yeah. perhaps um, someone you could explain. Yeah. So there's a question, how do you personalize a text with chat GPT? Would you mind modeling it? Yeah. Or but I think you're planning on yeah, we can doing do a demonstration. We can do it now. Oh, we can okay. Do it now. Yeah. So how do I do this? Or should I do uh, that on here? You can do it on here. Okay. But then right. the people in the room won't Yeah, see. they won't see. Okay. Yeah, you so do it there. I'll do the same around. thing here. Yeah. You do it there. I'll do the same thing here. Yeah. If I can find it. So here's Give chat GPT. Moment. Oh, well, if you have, uh, uh, can I just have a quick uh, look who who has got an account already? Okay, all right. mm -hmm. I would uh, encourage you all. Have you got computers with you? It's, I... not, it's not allowing you to log in. That's a sucks. Yeah. Have, uh, issue that when teaching is based on, okay. Oh. Some of the website. Oh. Issue. Oh, well. because I, oh, I got, well, I just I'm got using in. my own data, and so I can get you in. Just got yeah. in yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's yeah. Lock, blocking you. Wow. Yeah, yeah. yeah but okay. it might be the public Wi Fi would let you okay. into less. Some people in the room here, uh, if they're logging in through the Griffith University public Wi Fi at the moment, can't get into it. But mm -hmm. yeah, so it just depends on your system um, whether you can get in, but certainly on private accounts you can. So if you want to, we yeah, can do so, the same prompt if you like. Yeah, okay. I'll make so, me sound really intelligent. I'm just going to sort of. Oh, what can, or should I just do one with German? But we don't have any other German teachers, do we? There's some online. Okay, a couple of German online, teachers. So I'll, I can do one for German or I can try to do one for I don't French. Know. Probably I could do as well, but like beyond that, sorry, mm -hmm. I can't. Okay, so um, you can put anything you want in. Let's let's just, uh, what would you, what, what should be? How do I got here? This is my personal account I opened. So I can recommend everyone just go to it. Open AI. Mm. Open AI. Open AI. Mm -hmm. Here, I can I can open up another thing. So if you go to Google, when you want to turn around and mm -hmm. can they see it? Yeah, uh -huh. probably. Ask for so if you go to But Google, somebody online has put the link in for people here. So okay. I so think we're all very, good. Very, online. Very easy chat GPT. I'll just quickly show you do a Google search um, chat GPT. Yeah, go to the open AI one where it says open AI. Click on it. Um, scroll down somewhere. And it try. says try chat GPT. Click on it. Okay. And it doesn't. It shouldn't open like this because it opens now because I'm already online. Okay, yeah. <laughs> but what it does, it, it gives you a page where you can put in your details, your email address, you uh, choose a password, like in, with other things, and then you sign up. And then it gives you access to this tool. You can play around for free. Only problem, sometimes there's too many people at the same time, and it won't let you in. It says, ah, sorry, this was just all a bit too much. Can you try later? Now, I usually try immediately again, and I get in. So it's, it's refresh. It's great. it just yeah. refreshes you in. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, so going back to maybe my own one that I had beforehand. So I'm just gonna, so the question really was around changing a text personalizing a text yeah. yeah so it was around changing the text so i'm just going to write um an english sentence why don't i just do that okay. i do an english yeah. sentence something else. I I have check, to yeah. 
the right and we can also drag it out. Oops. Office. List some. Oh, sorry. That sorry. Like oh, context. Context of embedded. Yeah. Those <laughs> types of coffees. It'd be interesting to see if we get the same reply. Okay. Oh, those types of coffee. Here we go. This will be interesting. Sure. Oh, got different, slightly different wording to our experience. <laughs> Thank you very much. And while we received our coffee, if you just have a quick look, I gave it a prompt that said there are several types. So this was my prompt I gave to chat uh, GPT. I just made that up, literally, context embedded <laughs> because we were getting our coffee. There are several types of coffee commonly found in Australian restaurants and, ca oh, and my, my prompt was restaurants in Australia often have a variety of coffees. List some of those types of coffee. Now, it gave me within seconds this list, which is pretty much what we all would have come up. With. And I did the same on mine and I got the same list, slightly different order. So <laughs> yeah, that happens as well. Exactly. Yeah. Happens oh. that happens as well. And it so, doesn't so mention sharing, cafe. Sharing I'm sharing this yeah. with everyone online. Hopefully everyone online can see that. Yes. So let me know if you can't. In terms of what chat GPT did here, it's not so different from searching something on Google, is it? Like if you ask Google something like this, you'd probably get a link to a website that lists those things. Now, the first difference is it makes the list for you automatically. It makes that list. So it has now looked at everything, all those websites, and it makes the list for you. But the next step that I'm doing now is what Google couldn't do, was never able to do, and what chat GPT as a generative AI is able to do. I can now give it, based on this, a different command. Okay, so I just said, write a short journal article based on this information. You ready? Yep. Yeah. on. Now we have two texts because yeah. we have this one. We'll have this one slightly yeah. different. <laughs> Still talking about Australian restaurants right through, so it's yeah. on board at the right yeah. through. And now comes the pièce de résistance. <laughs> Answering the online question. Mm -hmm. Ready? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a bit short. This is pretty short. Mm. Five year old, you could probably not give a lot of mm. information. You can you can have coffee. Yours is a bit. Let's get no. Mm -hmm. Ready? Go. 
flower shoots, outlets. On the potent concepts. So you can play around or so what? Yeah. So you can play around with that initial thing. So initially I have a list of words, haven't I? Like for language learning. And with that list of words, I can now do lots and lots of operations. And I can personalize those operations. I can create a simple text with those words, or I can create a much more sophisticated word uh, text that will use a lot more vocabulary that is more for the proficient um, advanced learner of a language. And then, of course, we could ask it to write that story for the five-year-old in German. Or... Oh, yeah, let's do that. Okay. What language will I pick? People so online, say... tell me what language you want. Oh, well, let's do German together and then oh, okay. write the right. version oh, or the translate the version. Okay. Trans translate the version for the five year old into German. Into simple German? Into, into German. Well, it should be simple. Should, it should be German. Okay. All right. Are we ready? Go ahead. We go. <laughs> In Australia, lieben Kaffee und Sie können Sie auswählen. So, the European European. Language, Our language framework. framework. Okay. That, that's use a, a text at, let's say, B1. At level B1. To produce a text to in German based on the previous, because you might do the previous, based on the previous information. Use uh, the the previous C text. Hmm? C no C. What was it? C. What's the abbreviation? Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, yeah. I don't know. What, what's the abbreviation? Tell me. C. CEFR. CEFR. To produce, to produce a text. a text in German based on the previous information that at yeah that is at level B1. Previous information that is at level B1. Okay. I think for me. No, it's the definition of being. Oh, okay. No, it took me a while. It gave you more. It told you what you actually. Oh. But mine's doing it in English. Level B1 of the European language framework requires a person to be able to. It's giving that explanation in English, whereas yours was in German. Maybe that's because of your history of asking questions in German before, which I don't do. I don't know. Okay, now C2. Hold on, I'm waiting. For, oh, here we go. I, I'm still getting my text. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> but that's interesting. So okay, Simone people, gave the people... explanation about yeah. CFR in German, did it? Is that right? Yes. Whereas mine, same, we put the same prompt in, but mine gave the definition in English. Uh -huh. And then it started the, the text. It knows you can't speak exactly. German. <laughs> A little bit. I've done a little bit German with it. I don't know. It doesn't know that. <laughs> no, well, it should know. It, it knows nothing. <laughs> it knows nothing. It's not supposed to remember. It just makes us because what I've done with it, Simone. What yeah. I. I don't know. I can't answer that. I mean, I'm one, the, how can I answer that? One thing that I've personally done, this is why I say it should know that I speak German, a little mm. bit of German, a little German. I guess that's why, because it knows how little German I speak. But <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I've made it all 
too clear how little German I speak, but um, I did once try typing something in in German and um, just a little, you know, like a what I've been doing today kind of thing and said and asked it to correct my German. And when I didn't know a word for something, I just left that part in English and it rewrote it for me in German. But compared to when I've asked it to write a text in Japanese, because I'm not a fluent speaker of German, I can't be 100%. It looks good to me, but I can't be 100% sure that it's correct. Um, but it was such basic text that it probably was. Um, but, yeah, whereas That's when I ask it to do, it's still going, when I ask it to write something in Japanese, then I can look and, you know, I can yeah. have a better idea. So as a, you know, competent reader of Japanese. So but that's I think different. your question is is a fundamental one. Why do we learn languages at all? Can you answer that? Yeah, but how we, you know, if, if the machine can uh, do everything in our in, in their state, mm. what is the motivation of learning the language? Probably not a lot. Why would you learn a language if you already have machine translation? You can have a Zoom meeting or a Teams meeting that has simultaneous lang language translation underneath. Would you learn a language if you had all those things? Would Would I you would. learn a language if you already had all those things? I would. Yes. I, I, I know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, 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 we leave the world like that, so you know. Can you... Well, then if, if that is your question, then you have to answer it yourself. You can't answer me or you can't question me or anybody else, because in this world, you don't actually have to learn a language anymore. And that's a very hard thing to say, but it's true. Well, but you don't need to write anything anymore. You don't have to, etc. So. On, at, on the ground floor at the moment, I mean, you may live in, in an academic, you know, higher, uh, yeah. but on the ground floor, most, many people still need on their day to, on, you know, in their lives, need to learn uh, a language, uh, another language if they want to travel or if they want, or, or if they want to, you know, work or, um, what you're describing is coming, because what happens at the top goes down so it is it, it is going to be available it is already available for, for more and more people but there are still a, a great portion of the population on earth who you know for whom this is not their everyday thing and it's just appearing so when it becomes then yes that's a question what what is the what is positive in this Oh, in, terms, in, in, terms, in, terms of, in terms of developing human, you know, the human beings. Mm. I, I think it's a point in time where we're deciding what oh, yeah, humanity is yes. and how much AI there is. And that is gonna, this is the big change that's happening. Mm. How much AI we... If some of us will travel, some of us will never travel. Some people never have a passport. But personal choice, they might just stay in their own country. A lot of people in the States, for example, 60% don't have their passport, you know. Um, so it's all about yourself as a human being, how much interaction you want to have. This is where we're at. And with COVID and with our kids sitting at home on their little machines and this and that and not having the social skills there, which is being noted at university levels as well, the ones that came in, having been through COVID, having been through the new ATAR system, et cetera, I notice they don't have that personal interaction. I think it just comes down to personal choice of how much do I want to talk with other human beings or am I happy to do my work using this technology? Mm -hmm. I think that's where, where it is. So I'm pro-human, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Yes, pro we don't have that yeah. input anymore. This has been decided for us. It's so already there. Use it or not, mm. it's yes, but I mean, it's being developed as we speak. It's already there. Do you really have an input? What it's asking is to provide input, but we don't really have the power to determine what happens with them. So it's a political choice more than anything. And it has huge social impacts and educational ones, but I think, you know, Trojan horse is already there. Yeah. Um, we are asked to work with it and hopefully we could manage it, but I very much doubt it actually, because it's already there. and. Unless you, it's the way you do it and who you are, because there's already that system. I think it was an article in the ABC was it yesterday about Dan, 
had shutting down this other system called Dan because it was doing that whole racist yeah, thing, yeah, etc., yeah. which is yeah, yeah biased, etc. Yeah. And then it's the material people are writing that material. So we've got access to everything. So it's coming down to you as a human being, as what you choose to do, and whether you're using it politically or not. Mm. Yeah, like criminals make services. We know that yeah. learning languages in the brain is so something that now if we let more and more things, of, what is going to happen to our brain? Mm -hmm. well, <laughs> all right, got you. all right. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to just pull it back. Okay, I'm just going to pull it back to this to the topic here. I totally understand your concerns. I think this is how I started too. There are many limitations. There are many concerns. Um, I sort of did the provocation to say you don't need to learn languages anymore. But why do you think I'm here? <laughs> and do a, do a talk about how to use chat GPT in language learning, because I very much believe that we should all learn another language for many, many reasons. And the reasons could be cognitive, the reasons could be social, the reason could be about empathy building, et cetera, et cetera. I could mention many, many reasons. I speak two languages fluently. I speak French well enough to kind of communicate. I can probably understand a bit of Dutch because it's so close to German, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to learn Japanese and failed because I was probably too too old. No, no, not too I old. tried Never to learn old. Spanish and failed. But anyway, so my provocation here is I'm actually here because I want people to learn languages. But I want them to learn languages with the help of generative AI, because it's a tool that can make it easier for us to actually personalize the journey, to really aim it at people at a particular, what we just did with the C1 and C2, et cetera. So it's just one example. You can personalize it even more. So these are our standards, you know, these are our national, whatever standards, but you can personalize to the children in your class and their interests and their levels and proficiency. So this is one thing you can do, the personalization. I'm just going to go back quickly because there's other things. Um, there's just a question here oh, too yeah. about whether so um, whether we can ask it to um, create a text that aligns to the Australian curriculum. I mean, you wouldn't be able to do version nine because that's too recent. Yeah, you can't do that. Um, like you can't do so, version nine. You know, um, that's something to think. But I guess that's these are all things that people can also um, experiment with. Are we going? Oh, what are we doing? Okay. I to text in Japanese. Let's see what happens with Japanese. Right. Okay. Text in Japanese. In Japanese. That responds to requirements. 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 For say year nine. Mm -hmm. Year nine. Um, Japanese yeah. in Japanese. Okay. in the Australian curriculum. Let's just go with that and see what it mm -hmm. does. Okay. And now, Japanese speakers, Sorry, you are asked to share, tell us what it does. Okay. Oh, it's still oh. Oh. oh, just oh, refresh. Just refresh. Mine worked. Mine's going. But um, refresh. just refresh, and uh, I would copy the prompt, and then you always copy the prompt so I don't have to rewrite it. <laughs> Write a text in Japanese that corresponds. So we've got it here coming, haven't yeah. we? Yeah. Yeah. Write a text in Japanese that corresponds to requirements for year nine Japanese in the Australian curriculum. And it did it still about the coffee culture. It kept it on, on topic. Yeah, because it's it well, kind of. Okay. Yeah. But, Japanese. Right, that corresponds to requirements in Japanese in for year nine Japanese mm -hmm. in the Australian curriculum. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's exactly. Is that it? Yep. Yep. Oh, 
Oh, so now it's explaining the year nine curriculum <laughs> first. Oh my god. Um, it's telling, which is what it did with the German before, but mine didn't do that. It went straight into the text. There you go. It knows like it. It knows. It knows. Yeah, yeah. It knows nothing. <laughs> no, we're still talking about the requirements. Oh, lovely. Um, it's telling us all. It's that one's just to explain. So the one that's on the screen up here, which you can't see, sorry, but maybe you can. Such and such. Um, that one's just explaining about it. I don't know. That's, I think because it's come up as a new chat, whereas mine was continuing on from the previous chat. You know, mine was in the. If you'd gone back to the types of Australian coffee one, if you went back to the previous chat and did it there, yeah, that one. If you do it in there. It would um, continue with the same thing. Is it again? Right. Sorry, right. You could go back to the other one and copy and paste it. That's what I always do. But anyway, sorry. Where was it? No, don't worry. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Okay, let's do you want me to do it? Yeah. Write a text in Japanese. Um, that corresponds to that corresponds to the uh, to requirements for year nine Japanese in the spelling it correctly Australian oops can't know yeah curriculum yep I'll go back and put the space in with the mouse <laughs> thank you okay enter curriculum oh curriculum all right enter there we go okay there we go yeah um oh it started talking about japanese tea traditional japanese tea oh interesting so it's not really continuing on but anyway but it's still um it's gone straight into a text so it's a little bit um it's a little bit i would say the kanji is a bit what is it full about on. what is it about it's talking about the tradition of tea drinking in japan um okay. japanese people can it's you a bit it? um it, it's a bit complex i think the one up here is a bit more uh the one that came up on mine the one that came up here for people in the room japanese speakers in the room it needs to, it needs to match the australian curriculum requirements for um of kanji because no yeah <laughs> yeah but i don't think but so but the one that it did for me was a lot simpler konnichiwa for kanji, so yes. kanji, how do you spell that? Kanji, yeah, yeah. like this. For kanji, this this kanji for oh. year nine Australian curriculum, year nine level. Mm. This one's a lot more. The one that it did for me though is a lot simpler. So, uh, but with uh, Australian year nine, yeah. It's more complicated. Than that. No, this is better. This is better. Okay. Mm. So for the text that came up for mine, still too difficult. So yeah. Okay. But now and now just another piece de resistance. And I'm I am doing it for you in Japanese because there's so many Japanese people here. Really just want, look at the next thing look at the next thing now guys look at the next uh, thing sorry just to some of the comments people online have been obviously having time to read this text a little bit um so some of the comments that have came uh, a reminder that the Australian curriculum achievement standards describe a C standard. So perhaps mentioning that kind of thing would be good. It says here that the kanji is too difficult for year nine. Um, but of course, you can always, that's the sort of adjustment that I think the teacher can make. Um, and, um, but the kanji use is also perfect. There are no mistakes. It's natural Japanese is a um, response. Um, uh, yeah, if you were asking a, um, a if a student had, produced it as their text you would easily be able to see that it's not written by a student um okay now here comes yeah. another piece de resistance get yeah. ready guys yeah. get ready but then somebody else said you can ask it to write a response like a 14 year old so okay. <laughs> i'll write a lesson plan about this text yeah oh. oops
Last question. <laughs> Cultural aspect. Get ready. Okay. Get ready. Hold on, hold on. Give me a moment. And if include an assessment item. Okay. Um, just oh, no. Yeah, just say in Python. Comma, including. Including a rubric. A rubric. Lovely. Okay, we're ready, ready? to go. Go. All right. Oh, oh, oh. oh. <laughs> oh it could be timing as well. First year teacher will never be the same. <laughs> <laughs> And like we said, and like I said right from the beginning, of course you need to go over this. You can't just use it as is, but you've got a grunt work here that has been done for you that would have taken you hours that you can now work with and you need to give it your own personal touch, of course. You need to go over it and ask, you know, change things, make it specific for your class and so on and so on. Link it to whatever area you're in at the moment, but you can give that to the <laughs> to ChatGPT as well. You can link it to the Australian curriculum. You can link it to content descriptors in the Australian curriculum and it will find them. So a lot of the kind of hard, like just planning and finding work, it can do for you. You will need to go over it though with your own expertise and check, is it too difficult? Check, what do I need to add? For example, I told it to kind of focus on particular words. I would then, I would actually go back here and like, tell me which words I, I want, I, will, I should focus on. You can ask it to write them. you a, a vocab list. And Definitions like, of those yes, words. Yeah. You can ask it to kind of create uh, 20 flashcards with, with words that are difficult in this text and definitions um, included. You can print this out, put it on flashcards and have flashcards ready. Lester has asked, yes. um, but is that effective pedagogy? And okay. um, no, you, no, Lester, you make it effective pedagogy. You use your own pedagogy and use chat gpt chat gpt knows nothing mm -hmm. it cannot think you can think and and apply pedagogical principles to what you are looking for and create activities etc cetera, etc cetera, according to your understanding of pedagogical principles you know, for example, and yeah. another mm -hmm. suggestion here is that you could also ask it to design the lesson according to a particular pedagogical framework. Absolutely. Yeah. You can say uh, include Vygotsky's zone of proximal development uh, for students A, B and C in this particular area and include uh, dialogues and um, peer peer group uh, interaction for another activity. You can literally give it either an overarching theory, like sociocultural language learning, for example, communicative approach, things like this, or you can give it specific things. Like you can say, and use a guided participation approach to the development of this lesson. Um, Lester has followed up by then saying, but could a trainee teacher um, or a new graduate, et cetera, know how to implement it? Um, they can produce what looks correct, but could they implement it correctly? But I guess that's what we all and that's do the big, with practice. That's the big question. And that's where we have to have an actual situation where somebody needs to teach and show us how they teach. This is just something that can be, is a tool. This is literally just a tool, yeah. Somebody has also asked if student submits work prepared using AI, how do you prove it's not their work, um, even though you say, think, you can tell it's not written by your student? How do you prove it? Yeah, that that is a sort of... Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, in the target language, have the students read it back. That was the... Um, yeah. 
Mm. So in a, mm. for a language learner, yeah. But it, this is, of course, a bigger question that's being discussed at the moment yeah. at UQ, as you, as you can imagine, at university settings where the question is, how can we prove if somebody has written the assignment themselves or how can we, and, and there's two levels, really, the, there's two levels. Do we need to prove it? So that's the question, you know, or do we now actually assume that people will use a whole range of tools, including ChatGPT, to fit, to do things? Yep. Just a lot of building on that, Simon. Um, I hear from uh, another friend in the School of Education at this university, in fact, who tells me that you can actually order this thing to write entire assignments with references and all. I'm just interested, if I would be now uh, a classroom teacher and I have a student teacher, coming from, say, the School of Education at UQ, is this going to impact how students will be assessed and trained this year and the year after? So not, not this year, I think. I don't think it's, it's, it's possible to change the assessment items this semester anyway, maybe next semester, but there was, um, I don't know what happened at Griffiths, but at UQ, everyone had to put something into their course profile that basically said we are aware of this tool if you use this tool so not banning it because banning it is like like banning the internet mm -hmm. you know <laughs> like so not uh, if you use this tool you need to acknowledge it with a sentence after your assignment something like this i use chat gpt in the drafting of my assignment that's the conversation i have who is uh, learning studying in QA this year? They are doing community project. Last mm -hmm. night, when they had their group uh, meeting online, I just sit right beside him. And then he mentioned about, because I talk about Ch Chat GPT with him. Mm -hmm. And then they mentioned, uh, how about I, we, we do some research on Chat GPT? I said that this is a good idea. You can do some research on that. But do you know that your teacher all know ChatGPT? If they put in the same question on ChatGPT, they will create the same answer. Mm -hmm. The teacher will exactly have the same feedback from ChatGPT that you search on it. So that I think that is something that they should all also aware that this is just a robot, a machine. Yeah, what you ask for, if I ask the same question, they will give me the exactly same answer. Well, not exactly, but because yeah, we just did the same thing and got slightly different answers, so that was interesting. I think um, acknowledging it is really important, as you say, Simone. We haven't at Griffith have to put that into our course profiles yet, but maybe that's that's coming up. But I was watching some professor on TV the other night saying that there should be something everything that's generated by by this should have something on it like in the future we're going to read novels and we won't know because you can ask it to write a whole novel you can. and we won't know mm. in the future was this written by a human or was it written yeah. Yeah. by a machine yeah. and that he was saying there needs to be something law or something that right. anything that's generated by that you know, has to have it right. 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 you yeah, the copyright okay. issue. Because last time when the uh, news come out with the a piece of our work that it's not created by human being, created by a machine. Mm -hmm. Do they do we own the copyright when you ask the chat GPT to create that for you? So that is another issue we need to look at as well. The well copyright very you quickly. Created it because you've asked yeah, you're, questions. You're, 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 as Simone says, it's a tool. That's how the company is claiming it. Yeah. That there are very big questions, absolutely, around copyright, intellectual property, and so on and so on. Is it Chat GPT's property? Exactly. So you know you have to kind of ask yourself here what's going on. You know, if they get input from humanity. Who owns what? That's right, and that's why I think what we will see in the near future is a lot more focus on that human machine collaboration and acknowledging that something like this can help us in our time kind of saving efforts it can save time for for example the work of teachers but it also is a new world that we have to kind of think about in terms of who owns what, etc. But let me just quickly go back because I mean, this is this is always you know once you go on chat, it's just like mind blowing, and you kind of you know you get into a rabbit hole. But just to go back because I what I what I try to do with my presentation here 
was actually to to give you a couple of oh no uh, <laughs> to give you a couple of um, ideas to play around with. And that's really all I'm interested at the moment is that ChatGPT can do a whole range of things that might be useful for education. Let's play around with it. Let's see what we as humans actually have to input because that's the next frontier in, in research, I think. That question around prompt writing, prompt engineering. So writing the, uh, the prompt, the, the tasks. What do we as humans need to bring to the table to get the best outcomes, to use this tool in a way that we really save time, we come up with efficient and effective new activities and things like this. And what is the pro this, this area is called prompt engineering. And that I think is going to be the frontier of research for the next few years. We probably only have about another 15 minutes. Okay, so I'll just I'll just go you know, really fast. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So because there's that I mean, this is one of those things you could literally talk about it, I think, for for days, you know. So but um here are some ideas again where I see the best case scenarios might be. It could be a personalized and collaborative tutor for students. It could adapt the content and pace and have this kind of cycle of feedback and support. I'm hoping that we come to a point where students work effectively um, and collaboratively with, with adaptive uh, AI. Adaptive AI is just another word for generative AI, so that they can reach their own learning goals. We do need careful preparation, teacher guidance for that, like you, what you were describing when you talked to your son. You know, we need to actually point out how this works. This is not a thinking machine. This is just a statistical thing. The dialogues you have with ChatGPT sound as if you have a dialogue with a human. If you can try it out, you can ask a question. Why do I feel so sad? And it will give you an answer. So it, it gives you the illusion of talking to another human. So you need to be careful about that. I also feel it's crucial for teacher education to include something like this in a critical way of how you can use it, how you can use it for personalized collaborative learning and how what we actually have to teach to our students in using it. It's here to stay. We know it's here to stay. It's only going to get bigger. Bigger and stronger. <laughs> and so here's a couple of things just to remind you, it can create all sorts of types of, of uh, text. If you give it the prompt, it will give you all sorts of text. It will give you a, a syllabus uh, in our world now, education. It, can give, it will give you, it knows the genres. It knows the different text types and genres. Um, so you can do it in... Um, a matter of seconds and a complete and coherent text. And it can be a feature, I think, that might be useful for language teachers who want to save time in creating materials. Now, specifically, it can do operations like this. It can complete a, a, a text, it can generate a text, summarize, it can translate, can paraphrase, something we can maybe use often, we use often in language teaching questions and answering sentiment analysis. This is an interesting one. It can analyze the sentiment of a given piece of text. That to me is the most scary one. It can analyze sentiment, determining whether it's positive, negative, neutral, and lots and lots of levels in between. It can classify text, it can spell check, of course, it can grammar correct. It can grammar correct. So that's something that mm. students could work with, mm. for example, as well. Or even teachers writing an exam. That's right. Super confident. Yeah, you need a new text in the language you teach, and you might have some questions about it, and you put it in JetGPD, and it's actually coming out grammatically correct. So if I would ask you to deliberately make mistakes, you it would do that too. So uh, I know of one particular if we ask uh, it to friend of mine, make mistakes. So a friend of mine um, gave it gave it the prompt, 
to uh, create a text with typical mistakes made by Brazilian learners of English. And it came up with that. And that person then used that text, gave it to their Brazilian learners of English to point out what might be right or wrong. Well, yeah, it can do that too. I right, can so also be used by students to say, see, this can't be done by the system because it's got the text. <laughs> yeah, well, well that's yeah, going to be. Uh, all right, so we need to, I, oh yeah, just before, because I have so uh, just very little time. Um, I think the assessment questions are deeper than how can we use it to cheat? I think the questions are, or how can students use it to cheat? Um, the questions are around what are we assessing? Hmm. Why are we always looking at an outcome and a product? And why are we not looking at the process? The pro absolutely all the levels of process. And with the advance of uh, advance, sorry, of, of chat GPT, this question has come to the forefront again, asking us ourselves, we've done this for, you know, 70 years or whatever, always the same type of stuff, the outcome-based question um, assessment, and we've probably neglected looking at the process. And how can we now reignite that conversation about what is assessment, why do we assess, what do we assess, how do we assess, what is the reason even for learning, and so on and so on. So fundamental pedagogical questions uh, have, have actually emerged again because of this which i think is really interesting all right so looking at some activities and i just put this all together quickly i can't go to into through everything in detail but these are some ideas for you to try out at home so it can generate dialogues uh, in the language for example that you want it can feedback on writing it can give feedback on writing it can create vocabulary lists on anything you want it can help with accent and pronunciation practice. It can even help with grading and assessment. And some specific ones I looked at is you can actually look at the four skills, the four basic skills, and ask yourself, what can ChatGPT do here? And here are some ideas in writing. It can practice vocabulary, generate examples. It can have sentence completion activities. Uh, collaborative writing activities, journaling activities, writing feedback activities, genre-based activities, just as some examples. Have a look at the, I'm going to share my my um, my uh, uh, slides as well, so you don't have to. Um, so these are just starting points for you to kind of play around with. In listening, you can use other AI programs like a text to speech program. So, ChatGPT, you can obviously create short passages. We have seen this now, but you can use uh, AI programs like text to speech programs, Google Text to Speech, Amazon Poly, Microsoft Text to Speech, and feed that into those text to speech programs. And those programs will actually speak the things for you. You can listen to authentic materials. GP can find authentic materials. Comprehension questions can ask learners comprehension questions after they listen to a passage. Multiple choice exercises you can use it to create multiple choice and listening to dialogues. So uh, ChatGPT does not have an inbuilt text to speech, though. You have to use another AI program that does it for you. It it's only a matter of time, though. <laughs> I think it's it's going to be included soon. Um, speaking, obviously, a lot it can create conversation prompts, role playing exercises, uh, pronunciation exercises, all sorts of things. Reading, vocabulary practice, practice, comprehension questions, close exercises. Write me a text about um, the French Revolution and. Um, leave out uh, 20 keywords as closed text. It will do that. It will do that in five, in two seconds. Mm -mm. So yeah, summarizing exercises, text analysis, and so on and so on and so on. So you just basically have to play around with quite a, a number of things. 
I put this in because I thought we had time to actually <laughs> try this out and we didn't. And I wanted to hear back from you of what kind of, you know, what, what you put in and what you got out. So if you want to, we can do like a one minute one. <laughs> You've got devices here too. Yeah, has anyone while we've been has online, anyone, perhaps that some of the people online have probably yeah. been trying it out, perhaps you could um, in the chat share anything that you've um, discovered if you've been playing around with it while we speak. And I can. Did you do some early oh, yeah. I remember. And um, I can type type any anything now here. There are lots of things that we're discussing different uh, years about and uh, it says um, the more specific questions you ask, the better mm. answer you get. Yeah. So if you say um, some general thing, like um, oh, I can't think of anything now. Like the writer takes a lot of Japanese tea or something, mm. or how do you make Japanese tea? Then the answer is going to be quite general. But then write a step by step guide of how to make a best mm -hmm. tea of Japan then it gives you a breakdown of plenty points um, about how to make it of negative or whatever. So they say it's a good idea to ask questions uh, in bullet point form oh, mm -hmm. so that, that they can write an answer response in bullet point form to get the specific uh, a, um, a podcast that I was listening to spoke about uh, somebody um, these people were still in quite a bit, like maybe beginning of this year or end of last year, and they had um, uh, asked it to, oh, I'm going on a family holiday to Italy, where should I stay or something like that. And it came back saying, I'm not, I'm not Google, I'm not, you know, da, da, da. And they said, uh, and so then they reworded it, uh, pretend you're a travel agent. Yes. How? What would you recommend? <laughs> yes. Where would you recommend I stay? And then, because we'd set up the scenario, then it worked. So again, it's all about the prompt. It's all about how you ask the question yes. as to what you get back. Very interesting. Yeah. Got a question. If, if I'm a cynic about big tech and I know if I'm given information, there's something for the technology company. Who's making money from my information? Is it uh, just um, kind people thinking about? technology and different platforms that can help the world or is there someone collecting my information as well yeah <laughs> sorry <laughs> yeah anything bit. anything you put in there is collected and it's not yours anymore yes yeah. that's right yeah um, at the moment it's open yes so everything i put into chat a gpt it will take in yes kind of statistically work with mm -hmm. and use algorithms and realize we weren't quite happy with that first Japanese text. We mm -hmm. thought it was too difficult. It figured that out. Mm -hmm. Next time it will probably give you a sim simpler version. So is that good or is that bad? Um, I'm asking you. Well, then you get to decide how much. Well, we don't really. All we can give is our email addresses no 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 don't give it any personal information okay. but no you're personal logged in you're ever. logged in with an email aren't you? oh yes so, yes, yeah. yes so it has oh that. yes 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 sorry mm. your email address is of course in there but but one of the things we learned very quickly was um we cannot give any detailed personal information in our for example in our personalized um um oh. For, for students so you know yes. write write something for little johnny or mm -hmm. something we can yes. no no names nothing yeah. no identifying kind of things so mm -hmm. that's very important because that we are actually already breaching a mm -hmm. um, privacy mm -hmm. law then if we do this yes. but in terms of your intellectual property mm -hmm. Because it's open, you are actually benefiting from lots and lots of other people's yes. intellectual property as well. So it's mm -hmm. at the moment, it's actually based on sharing. Okay. Yeah. And so the developers behind it, where are they located? Are they in the States plus um, Europe or? OpenAI is an American company, okay. but they've just sold everything to Microsoft. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think oh. Yeah. Um, so Microsoft is going to monetize it very soon, yeah. for sure. <laughs> really? Yeah. Um, um, three of them from China. Yes. Three, I think three or two of them from the United States. Mm -hmm. And another one, I think, two main companies that is three. 
Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. It will be monetized. It will be monetized for sure. For sure. Um, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Simone said she was happy to share her slides. Mm. People who are on, like, how will that be shared? Because I don't have everyone's email addresses. Um, maybe I could ask them to, people who want it. To, to, once it's been edited yeah. by, by a group. Oh, that's the recording, but those, the PowerPoint the slides. Then I can put that, the, the URL for where they can access that and yep. maybe the PowerPoint as well. Yeah, in yeah absolutely. As a PDF or whatever, yeah. Email, so, yeah. 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 So it'll be emailed to the whole membership, is that what you mean? Or to, yeah, to not to just to everyone who was here? Yeah. Because yes. I don't well, have everyone's email I'm addresses. Happy. I'm, yeah, happy. Yeah. I'm happy. Oh, happy. thank you so much. I just commented, um, share it with my non-language teaching colleagues. With what? Your non-language teaching colleagues. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You can also, and with your if you are interested, which school, where are you? I prefer secondary college. Okay, maybe I need to talk to you about this because yes. we are actually, I'm actually doing a big research project at the moment right. and we are interested in teachers yes. who, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> who are interested to come on board. So if you are interested, if you could give me your email addresses oh. afterwards. Anyone then, online who's listening to yes, us? Um, yes. Uh, we, are, we are speaking to Is your education your email address on the PowerPoint slide somewhere? Oh, Hopefully, not, maybe not, you can add sorry. that. It's another thing to add. Yeah, that's all right. All right. Kate is going to. Give yes, us thank you. Yeah. We might finish up here. Thank you very much, Simone. Um, I think that was a really timely, uh, relevant, and uh, interesting uh, forum. And uh, I thought I found it really interesting that um, I guess thanks to this generative AI, I guess AI, um, it sort of boiled down to the fundamental question about what's the point, like why do we teach languages? Um, yeah, how do we motivate students and those kind of things? But um, I guess for language teachers, it's um, still human aspects such as like caring for students and motivating um, those kind of human skills are still going to be valued. But I guess it's, um, I guess a bit of a self-exploration for us to do about um, like what's the point of teaching languages. Mm. Yeah, it's something to think about. I think somebody um, online, perhaps somebody here in the room said that too, though, like it, it's not just languages, but it affects mm. every subject. Yeah, yeah. yeah. actually. What's the point of my, teaching history? Yeah. <laughs> my wife yeah. works at a uh, publisher and uh, she says that lots of published companies are temporarily, I guess, closing down like book uh, proposal submissions because they are some wow. people who are just writing up using yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or, or really, me a book. Yeah. <laughs> like, of course, I'm not like, <laughs> so, yeah, it's not about teaching. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I think in Japan, there was, I think they published the very first book that's written completely yeah. by AI, like yeah. this AI. Uh -huh. So wow. there are films which are eighty percent well, created yeah. now by. AI. But just so, a bit. But one last. Sorry, I'm sorry. Just to speak back. I actually feel, Kita, that um, this is a, a moment where language. I'm hoping language is actually be, will become more important than not less because we now can go back to the much more fundamental questions of of teaching, learning, who we are as humans. And I feel we are as humans, humans, people who need to have that wide knowledge of the world, mm -hmm. including a, a, a language. So it's not so utilitarian anymore. It's not about why are we using it? It's because we are humans that we need to learn a language. That's how I would see it, a huge kind of shift towards a much more in, in German it's called Bildung, um, uh, kind of focused a humanitarian and humanities-based understanding of what we are as humans. And to that, we always have to include a, a, a language or languages, you know. That's just my feeling, but thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, thank, you very much. thank you. We could thank talk you. all night. It's been amazing. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Catherine. No, yeah. <laughs> that was a bit crazy. I hope it was okay for everyone online. Um, so I think when the recording goes out and along with uh, 
Simone's slides. Uh, there will also be Simone's email address. So if people did pick the people online also interested in being involved in your research. So, um, you know, or you can always contact Lee to get that if you need to know that sooner, etc. So thank you, everyone. We had 40 people online. Yeah, 40. <laughs> thank you.